<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a, another episode of Huffman Racing Radio. I'm your host, Landon Huffman, and it has been a few weeks since our last episode here on the podcast. You guys have had a nice little break from hearing our voice. And uh, yeah, we've got an episode for you today. Sitting here to my right is Who's Your Daddy, Seth Brotherton. Seth, how we doing? Doing good. That's good to hear. Uh, sitting to his right is another special guest and a longtime old friend of mine, 2024 World of Outlaws Rookie of the Year contender and uh, big block modified racer slash asphalt racer slash bunch of different things, Max McLaughlin. How we doing, Max? Oh, I'm glad to be here, man. It's been a while. It has been a while. So Max is fresh off of uh, a move back to Moore's Vegas. So Yeah, long awaited. Um, finally out of the cold. I had, had a good time up there. It's been a good couple of years, but I'm, I'm definitely glad to be back. Also fresh off a cruise. Fresh off the cruise. Fresh off the boat. Uh, Where did we go? Longer, uh, almost on there longer than I wanted to be. The waves were so bad they couldn't port in Miami. Had to stay an extra day on the boat. Man, it was. Uh, yeah, that thing was moving. Where was our Where was our uh, destination? We went to uh, Dominican Republic first, mm. then the U.S. Virgin Islands, then the British Virgin Islands. We we're supposed to go to the Bahamas, but the weather was so bad that they canceled the last day. A lot of Virgin Islands. Uh, <laughs> did, in the in the DR, did, do you drink beer? I drink beer. Yeah. Did you drink at El Presidente? I did. Mm, I did. Good stuff. Was it not phenomenal? <clears throat> it's pretty good. It yeah. is. It it's is either a, that or Corona. It's like yeah, but don't ask for a Corona. They don't like that. No. No. They were bringing them out. When we were getting on the bus to go to the beach. They were like, "Oh, best beach, all inclusive." And dude, we got there. It was not the best beach. I think we, we got hustled. <laughs> 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 we get there, and I mean, there had to be fifty people buying bracelets, knockoff sunglasses. I got a pair of. Of spies, I haven't seen spy sunglasses in a while. Man, those used to be on JRM cars. Yeah, I dude, remember they were that everywhere. And uh, I, I got a sweet pair of knockoff spies, for <laughs> about fifteen dollars. I got a the nice DL. double adjustable bracelet. Man, I never wear. I don't even know where it is. What does it say? Nothing. Oh, <laughs> just, was it cool colors? I don't know what it's made out of some sort of wood, <laughs> coconuts, driftwood. Really sure. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful piece for sure. Yeah, when I went to the DR for uh, it wasn't my honeymoon; it was my one year anniversary trip. I asked for a Corona, and they laughed at me and gave me an El Presidente. Ain't bad. Uh, and then I shattered it all over my my walkout or swim out in my room. My wife got really mad. But yeah, El Presidente is really good. It's good on draft. But I'm glad you survived the boat. Um, yeah. Me too. We're going to talk about a bunch of different things today. One in particular, yesterday I pissed off the dirt community. <laughs> um, it was a it was an awesome uh, Twitter thread, and pretty much every big name in dirt racing commented on it, including Max. So we're going to discuss uh, a little bit about that later. Actually, I think it'll be a good conversation because Max has experienced <clears throat> both sides of the, uh, I guess, both sides of the motorsports world in dirt and asphalt. He was a full-time asphalt racer at one point, and now he is going back full-time dirt racing. So we'll touch on that, kind of get his insight and see what he has to say about uh, the two genres working together or maybe what we can learn from one or the other moving forward. Um, where the hell have you been, Seth? <laughs> Around? Around where? Definitely not huffing racing. <laughs> it's off-season, <laughs> bud. That does not mean anything that means a lot we have a race car to build have you been down there building it <laughs> yeah it didn't look like it what do you mean it didn't look much different than it did two weeks ago that is Progress. entirely not true you seen it bare <laughs> Kate. peanut gallery yeah rj and rj's here in the peanut gallery he wants to comment too but this is also his first time at huffman racing since florence so <laughs> i wish i could see it don't even on. don't even <laughs> act like yes this is the first time you've been here since florence rj yeah, <laughs> he had to think about it a little bit. There he, has he, been. Are you serious? You seriously? Party. You seriously saying that uh, I ain't done no work down there? I mean, Rich has been here a lot. Well, me and Rich have been working together because he's a he's Rich, a Rich good employee. Working while you were good free the floor. employee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I did more than sweep the floor. You're this blasphemy. I'll be, I'll be back <laughs> in a couple months. <laughs> About time to load up. Yeah, I figured. Well. Yeah, I started to say, two days before we have to go race, and I hope you get it done. Also, between our last podcast and today, we did have a Christmas party. Nobody... Uh, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't as rowdy. It wasn't a circus. No. Like I think time. it... You know what I think? 
I think because we had more We've space. We've matured as individuals. That is entirely not true. <laughs> there was more space. There was more space, and I just don't think. I think, see, year one of the Christmas party, everything was really confined. Yeah, it, and it was Christmas and championship party. Yeah, that is true. We did win a championship. We didn't win a championship this year, but it was just more confined. Everybody was on top of each other. It forced people to dance, and it forced people to drink, and we just started smoking cigars inside that year and all kinds of shit. So this year, it was like, it was more tame. Well. But we had a lot of liquor. Last year, we also drank all day leading up to. Yeah. So we were primed and ready. This year, I didn't get to do that. No, you had a company Christmas party to attend before the real one. It was just a cold start rather than just heating oil all day. Yep. I kind of, I got, I pre-gamed a little bit. I mean, we we taste tested the drinks, but. Shallow Side came and played again. They were badass. The drummer got sick, so they had to have a freaking last minute, uh drummer fill in that that guy was actually probably the drunkest guy out of the whole at the whole <laughs> the drummer yeah he's probably at the bar the fill-in drummer i think he was the <laughs> drunkest guy yeah, at the whole party play the drums i could have been i could have been on that man that would have been incredible <laughs> by the way everybody max mclaughlin is here to play the drums <laughs> I really can. uh that actually he was not the drunkest guy uh we did have a one female individual yes. who was severely intoxicated busted the old dome yeah. on the concrete floor. smoked the noggin off the concrete Ooh. no blood that's good. definitely a concussion <laughs> bump. Oh, yeah without a doubt yeah 100 oh, percent had one of those goosebumps just gorging off the head well we'll talk a little bit about the christmas party we've got some other stuff to touch on uh but we really appreciate you guys tuning in per normal and uh it's going to be fun. I'm excited to have Max on. Uh, we've got some stuff to talk about. We've done some cool things, and uh, we've been in some drama before, so we might have to touch a little bit on that. But thank you guys for, for clicking on this episode. We're going to go ahead and hop right into it. So to give you guys a little bit of backstory on uh, Max and I's relationship, my dad actually crew chief for Max in the 2019, uh, I guess now it would be Arkham and Ards East Series, then it was K&N Pro Series mm-hmm. East. I think it was still K&N then. Yeah, it was K&N. Uh, for Hattori Racing Enterprises, HRE. Yep, that's still their name. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure. They've changed a lot since then. But uh, Dad was crew chief, and uh, I actually spotted for Max uh, almost the whole year. There was a few races that I had to miss. I don't remember why. Uh, but I did miss a few races, including the one that they won, which sucked. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I'm still sad about that one. <coughs> we should have won. We should have won another one. Maybe maybe two more, but at Spotter least one more. Right. No, Spotter was trying to fight for him, though. He was fighting. Yeah. Said, oh, yeah, you were hot. I was I was pissed. He was pissed, but I was even more yeah. pissed. He was in victory lane. I come across the track, got into victory lane, yeah. <laughs> so Dang. I'll talk about that in a second, because now now me and uh, the individual I was upset with actually get along. So That's good. Yeah. I do too. Yeah. I just gave him my indoor ride. I had way too much going on this winter. I was supposed to drive a TQ midget, and I called him. I'm like, hey, man, you, you want to bail me out? Yeah, we'll talk about that because I, I haven't really – I mean, we're not like, I guess, good friends or anything, but we we have discussions sometimes, so it's also interesting. But, um, yeah, I spotted for Max, and then I was also spotting for uh, HRE's truck team, which was Austin Hill at the time. I did – I don't know, six or eight races. The last race I did was uh, when Johnny Sauter and Austin Hill were getting Iowa. into it. Yeah, yeah Iowa. So, <laughs> actually, I was the spotter for for the entirety of the uh, <laughs> the Austin Hill versus Johnny Sauter saga. And uh, it ended with me being on Radioactive, uh, coaching him through Johnny Sauter, full throttle on us under caution, which is my first experience with a full throttle situation. Um, obviously we had one this year. Yeah. (laughs) But, uh, so that was interesting. And I actually just shared the post on Twitter last night or X and it was the radioactive. And, uh, at the time I was very thankful that they didn't put it in there, but now I kind of wish they would have, cause it would have made it even better. But right before Austin wrecked Johnny, Johnny, got into Austin getting into turn one and got us out of shape. And immediately after that happened, I said, don't take that shit from him. And the next corner, Austin freaking junked him. And then uh, I got in an argument on the spotter stand. And then that was my last time I spotted for HRE. Mm. Yeah, on, on the national level. But anyways, that's that's our connection. And um, we haven't been great friends since then because you moved away yeah, right after that. But Where'd you move yeah. to? New York, Syracuse area. Oh, fuck that. I went to Rochester for... 
a year and a half, and then I got with another team and had to move to Syracuse. So all upstate, yeah, cold, I, same I, thing. I guess this is a a good opportunity for you to tell them briefly sort of your story. So those of you, uh, if you're not familiar with Max, he is uh, Magic Shoes Mike McLaughlin's son. And did your dad's dad race? No. Nope. So you're a second generation driver. Yep. Um, so if you if you don't know Mike, look him up. Decorated driver. He's won a bunch of won way more than me and Max probably ever will. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Max has won a lot. Definitely more than I more than I'll ever win probably. But yeah, Max, tell him I guess uh, sort of how you got into racing, or at least briefly your story. I mean, I've told him already that you've lived the asphalt side and the dirt side but it started on dirt right yeah yeah for sure i mean right right here millbridge speedway right on the shore that's kind of where i grew up racing and then uh you know just worked into ump modifies with nick hoffman and i didn't really uh you know know if i was going to do racing as like a hobby or job whatever and then uh you know 2015 the end of the year dad was done you know he owned my cars up until then um, you know, Coy Gibbs was a huge contributor on the, the outlaw cart stuff. He kind of funded my career young and, uh, if it wasn't for Coy, I definitely wouldn't have got to, you know, the spot with the UMPs and if it wasn't for Hoffman, I'd have never got in the UMPs and then, uh, Mohawk Northeast, Al Hankey's kind of, you know, not kind of, he's been the guy for my career. You know, he, uh, hired me to run his big block and full time as a 16 year old and, um, you know, still run it to this day. There was a, you know, he went and sponsored me on the Arca stuff for a few years there and he ran some races obviously and um we were able to have some success there and then ended up going to drive for you know sweeteners plus right after covid and i don't know i think that's kind of what i had a chance to go back asphalt race in 2021 i was making no money so uh, selling stuff on facebook marketplace to <laughs> eat. like whatever i just go down into the port. i wouldn't know anything about that <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I'm, I'm driving the ARCA car for free, you know what I mean? It's hard, you know, yeah. but that's what I had to do. And then, uh, you know, COVID hits, whatever, and we went and ran third at Bristol. And uh, I didn't know if I was going to run Phoenix or not, whatever. So I was like, hey, you know what? I got opportunity to go run a dirt car down there for uh, Vic Coffee and Sweeteners Plus. And uh, I did it. We ended up winning the race. And right then, when I crossed the finish line, I was like, I'm going back. Like, I knew it right there. I was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's it's just, uh, you know, that fire that, I don't know, inside me, it just lit up, you know. Obviously, we had good stuff. We didn't have Joe Gibbs and, you know, Sam Mayer and Ty Gibbs were two that, you know, kind of dominated at, For sure. at our time, you know. Yeah. And uh, it was frustrating. You know, it felt like we were constantly just, if a third place was a win, and we had however many third places in 2020, and then didn't really lead in many opportunities, and you got that opportunity to go dirt racing, and, you know, however many years later, three years later, um, you know, we've won a, a lot of races over the last three years and get an opportunity to go World of Outlaw racing next year. So it's uh, pretty dang cool. Yeah. How old are you now? 23. 23. <coughs> I'm, I'm pretty old. 27. I feel like Max is like my age, but I'm about to be 28. God dang, I'm going to have to start talking about that. Um, <laughs> you've won some modified races. Yeah. So he, you've run, he's run some asphalt modified stuff too for Gary Putnam and uh, – did that last year you've done that last couple of years yeah, right? last couple of years um you know he kind of threw me in same year 2020 uh, mm -hmm. you know i thought the arca deal was kind of coming <clears> to an end there with toyota and um you know went and did the dirt stuff won my first super dirt series race there with vic and then a week later we went to the north south shootout with gary's car and that was only my second time in a modified and we ended up winning the north south shootout um and then after that i was like all right if i'm gonna do any asphalt racing you know i want to try to be in, in the best stuff and that's what it takes i mean you can take a bad dirt car not a bad one but an okay dirt car put it on the fence and drive to the lead you ain't doing that you know i mean you can't take a bad asphalt car and make up for it you just can't and uh you know the only place i think you could probably do that is short track racing like north wilkesboro somewhere where your tires are gone the guy that saves you see <clears throat> matt hirschman in the asphalt modifies does it all the time he's probably the best at saving tires in my opinion he can do it but minus that, the NASCAR stuff, man, if, if you're not in the best stuff, and it's it's near impossible to win. And um, I got that feeling of winning again, and I never uh, really looked back. Well, I think that's – I think you're exactly right. I think that's also what sucks from the asphalt side. You know, I've gotten an opportunity to do some stuff at the truck level and um, the ARCA level. And <clears throat> the first time I drove an ARCA car, I drove for Venturini. So I had a shot – a good shot there probably should have won that race and got wrecked other than that i've really not been in stuff that is capable of even 
really running the top 10 yeah. and it makes you second guess like your it makes you second guess your ability to do it plus i've said this before on this podcast i've said it in my youtube channel i've said it multiple times racing is a sport of very very many lows and a few highs and the highs that you have make all the lows and the grind worth it however if you're not racing with a shot to win you're probably not going to have that high that you're looking for very often if not at all yeah and that's one thing that's helped me this year is i just got to race a lot for one but i'm also racing with a shot to win every week and i just don't see how people can do it and continuously do it for a living and not have a shot at winning I've because said that. i mean i don't know how some of these guys just go there and start and park and run 15th every week or if you run 18th and you're like man that was a great weekend yeah, and, and no more way. power to those guys because they're making a living doing yeah. it making more money than i'm making right now but at the same time i just couldn't do it i don't know i, I physically and mentally i don't think that i'm built to go out there and just be middle of the pack and accept it that's kind of what everybody asked me is like why'd you leave asphalt first of all i didn't have a huge checkbook and you know i had one sponsor that was you know very good but we we couldn't run a full season arc i mean we ran nine races in 2020 that's what we were funded for and, and you know mike greachy is the reason we got to run nine races we were only funded for like four you yeah know? and uh you know for what budget we ran nine races on Venturini and them, you know, other teams at the time couldn't have ran three races for that. Right. So uh, we budgeted well, and then Bill McAnally, uh, you know, helped us go to a few other races with the Napa on the car, and um, you know, it was a good time. But those were the two hardest years of my life racing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've used to run up front and contending for wins, and then, you know, uh, you know, we had decent stuff. I mean, you remember we had one car that was horrible and one real old car that your dad built originally, an MDM, and. That thing was our best car you know uh, it was a 2014 you know chassis but for whatever was, reason everywhere we took it it was good yeah, yeah it was good we you know probably should have won <laughs> memphis there and got wrecked and um you know ran third at bristol third at gateway and for that year those two years a third was a win for what we had you know we weren't going to go out and and just plain old past ty gibbs or sam mayor no it just wasn't gonna happen. we were racing against we were essentially racing against a cup program and an Xfinity program, more or less. Well, I guess he was Sam was driving for GMS so at the yeah. time. That would have been it was two real good. Programs. Which they might have had their Xfinity program then at the time. I don't I remember, but did, either yeah. way, they were they were good. They had great people working too. So not only did they have good cars, but they had Mark McFarland and Marty Lindley working on those two race cars at the time. Which you know, when you when you combine a lot of money with good equipment with good people, you're always going to be yeah. fast and no tough. Doubt. Um, I think that's also a good point. Talking about having a shot to win, I would say that's probably why not only I'm sure you're making more money dirt racing, but which we'll talk about that, but you got a shot to win everywhere you go. Yeah. And if your car's a little off, you still have a shot to win. Yeah. Or you can make up for it. Charlotte this year, um, yeah, I started, I think, seventh in the race. Dropped back to tenth because my car was not, you know, it was free. Not good enough to run where everybody else was. So uh, I said, you know, all right, all right, I'm gonna go the fence. Nobody else is on the fence, but it was pretty rough cushion up there. And um, you know, the big blocks we have them big wide bumpers. You make one mistake on the fence, and your right front's in the fence, and you're going over or whatever, you know. So um, put it up there and got to fourth. You know, just you know, driving the heck out of it. And that's something that you could never do in a pavement car. You know, you can't just switch your lane. You mean everybody's around the same line essentially all the time. Yeah, your your move around <clears throat> on asphalt is very minimal. Mm -hmm. It might feel, I don't know, you can search a little, but it also depends on the track. Yeah. Like, I mean, especially at a short track level. I mean, the mile and a half stuff might be different, but yeah, I've never really sure. experienced that. So, For sure. No, it's just, you know, like you said, just going back to the wind and stuff. I mean, I definitely doubted myself those two years. I didn't have much asphalt experience. So, um, you know, minus Watkins Glen winning there. The road courses, our car was excellent on. We always had good success at the road courses. and But the oval stuff, I was always just okay. And then... Um, you know, going and getting a shot to run Gary's car at the end of the year and, and going winning uh, a big asphalt modified event definitely, uh, you know, showed that I could do it. And then um, that was just a whole different feeling. And then after that, I was like, you know what, I'm unless I can get in a really good car full time again, which is probably never going to happen, um, I'm probably just going to stick to dirt racing. And I'm happy where I'm at, obviously. I mean, doing all right, you know, financially. And you see the guys 
that you know do really well Davenport's and the Thorntons and Overton's they're clearing um, you know the cars taking in over a million dollars so driver percentage is, is pretty good at that point you no know? doubt and you see t-shirt sales and, and all that I think you can do it right we ain't making cup money but um, you know for if you're successful and you work hard at it you see guys like Nick Hoffman you know the guys that put the time in and and get better um, I think you can definitely make a living dirt racing so that was a good segue into the next discussion. So yesterday on Twitter, <laughs> I made a tweet. And I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to set the stage for this because I don't know a ton about dirt racing. Really, the only thing, that, what I do know about dirt racing is from watching people like Max that I've been friends with or been acquaintances, acquaintances with, can't speak, um, over the course of my asphalt racing career or time in motorsports in general, that... I care to watch like I I'm not just going to turn a dirt race on and watch it or I used to not just turn a dirt race on and watch it to watch it. I would always need to be watching someone. So <clears throat> my knowledge of the dirt side of the industry is not great, but the gateway dirt nationals were this weekend and obviously in short track asphalt racing purse money and, or the lack thereof and the cost of what it takes to do it is always at the forefront and we're always bombarded with how much more money dirt pays purse wise and all these big events 20 thirty thousand to win are relatively small um in the grand scheme of things for dirt i mean you have several shows that pay over a million dollars or a million dollars which i don't even know if there's <coughs> i don't even know if there's a nascar cup event that pays that these days maybe the all-star, All-Star yeah the 500, maybe the 500 yeah so if you look at it on that scale, that's incredible. But, you know, we're we're thrown to the fire with that, and we see that a lot from an asphalt side looking at the dirt side. So you think, okay, there's got to be a ton of money in dirt. So my idea of if there's a ton of money, and I always see merchandise sales through the roof, you know, that's what, that's, that is the dirt culture. You sell a lot of T-shirts, you know, you race for a lot of money, the stands are packed. So the first thing that I think of when I think of that is these guys are superstars in my eyes because they're doing it for a living. They're racing, making money, selling a lot of t-shirts. The fans adore them, especially if you watch, say, the Gateway Dirt Nationals. I mean, those fans were going crazy for whichever driver that they were pulling for. Every driver had a following there, and or at least the ones that they showed and talked about. So so I correlate that with, you know, fan or star power. When I think of the asphalt star power, I don't see fans doing that for a driver. But from a social media standpoint, a lot of the asphalt drivers have large social followings. And maybe not all of them, but especially in the trucks, ARCA trucks, that nature. But when you get to the mainstays in Xfinity and your cup drivers, I don't really see people geeking out over them all the time, but they all have considerable social followings. So then I watch Gateway Dirt Nationals. And I see RTJ, people going crazy for RTJ. I know that he's won a lot of money this year, purse money. Mm -hmm. And then I go look at his social media, and I'm like, how is this guy not, like, how does he not have 100,000 followers? No, he doesn't do anything, (laughs) hardly. But he doesn't have to. So my point in my tweet, which was, I asked the Twitter world why some of these stars on dirt, like, for instance, Jonathan Davenport, probably made the most money of anybody close to it mm-hmm. yeah, uh, last year in dirt late model racing. He only has 6,000 Instagram followers. Mm-hmm. You have 30 some thousand. Yours is pretty large for dirt. Yeah. Um, but you also had asphalt crossover. Yeah. But I did a lot more social media stuff when I was on asphalt. Okay. I don't do anything anymore. Don't have to. I can't tell you the last time that I like, I don't know. I mean, I was trying to for a while, but then I'm like, it's not worth it to you worth now. It. Yeah, I don't okay. want to. I'm not really good with social media. I don't want to pay somebody to do it, right? Or like help me do it. So I'm just like, all right, I'll post a picture every once in a while, and I can see like I'm not getting the followers I used to. I was climbing really good for a while, and I guess it's not that I don't care. It's just like I'm in the shop working. I'm trying to get my race car better, and I don't know. I mean, it's so when, when I was asphalt racing, it was huge. It's all you. It's all you had to do because it's forced down our throat. Yeah. But that I'm getting long-winded with my statement. But my, I guess my point on Twitter was, why do some of these dirt guys that, in my opinion, are stars of the sport, 
making a lot of money, winning races, um, and take a lot of money however you want to take it. I mean, I know that comparatively speaking, that may not necessarily be the case to some people in the asphalt world, but in my eyes, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, why are they not more active on social media? Why do they not have to have a social media following like we are conditioned to think that we have to have? Because for me to be able to race, I have to do social media. It's literally the only way that I am able to race. And so I put that question out there, and every single dirt personality that has any following decided that they were going to comment. Rico Abreu, Kyle Larson, Davenport, everyone decided they wanted to join the conversation, which is actually good, but I felt like I was getting fried a little bit for an honest question because I don't really know. So now that Max is sitting here, I mean, I guess you kind of just hit on it, but what I learned or what Larson felt like the reasoning behind asphalt guys having a following was the national TV audience. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're, but I also just from talking to you understand that, um, it's just not as important on dirt because, because why? Yeah. I I didn't even think about national TV audience. That's probably a good point too. Yeah. That's, that's definitely a good point for sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that that's huge, obviously. Um, but the sponsors are not necessarily looking for that, yeah, right? Well, or well, the thing is, I just think it comes to a point where like you don't need as much sponsorship. You really don't. I mean, like, like so say how much is it? I don't even know what it is to rent an Xfinity. Well, I say rent. Like that's how all asphalt racing is. is rent. Can I rent your car? Can I rent your car? I can't tell you how many people. Hey, you want to run Martinsville? Hell yeah, sure. All right, <laughs> here you just got to bring this much money. Right. Well, why the hell did you ask? Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? it's like, yeah, I want to run Martinsville, but you it's know. like that at all levels of it's asphalt crazy. racing. Yeah. From the bottom to the top. And so like I've been lucky enough to stay in the asphalt a little bit. You know, um I ran Xfinity race and Colin Fern found some sponsorship first and said, Hey, like, I want a New York guy. So that was cool. Uh, that's rare. Yeah. Um but then Gary Putnam and, and Mike Curb at Curb Records, they've kind of kept me in the asphalt a little bit. Um, thankfully. But other than that, I mean I've I haven't done any asphalt racing because I don't have money to go rent a ride. And dirt racing, like, I can't tell you how many other dirt cars I've ran last year. Not just, you know, Al Hankey's dirt car, but, um, you know, I rent and ran some special shows for, like, five different teams last year. You know, it's just, like, you're chasing money events. And I think, so, what do you what is it to rent, like, a Joe Gibbs cup car? Do you even know? Well, I don't know if you can rent a cup car. Not a cup car, sorry, Xfinity. Car. Okay, yeah, Xfinity. an Xfinity. You're probably, I mean, a good truck is a hundred grand. So yeah. I would say Xfinity is probably, yeah, or more. Yeah. I mean, you're if you get a uh, if you get a hundred racks for like, well, KBM is no longer existent, but a mm. hundred racks for a good truck is like, okay, that's not a terrible deal. Which yeah. is crazy for me to even say because yeah. that's stupid. That's um, nice. I would say a JGR car is probably. That's, you might could you might could get it. I, I well I don't know. I, okay, I've so never that, put that into perspective. Maybe right? four hundred is too much. So Joe Gibbs has already got all their cars in place. Four hundred. You're just coming much, yeah. and bringing a check just to drive the car, right? Yeah. So a dirt late model team, per se, has their deal in place. They got the hauler. They got the cars. They got the crew guys already, right? If you're a driver, there's no rent. Well, I'm sure there's people that bring money to the table, but but like, they don't last. So you're saying we'll just say okay, one race, two hundred fifty thousand for an Xfinity car. So that guy's got to go sell one sponsor, however many sponsors put one race together. We can run a whole World of Outlaw season plus extras for two hundred fifty thousand. Like we can. I mean, that's and you're we can racing run for eighty purse. races on two hundred fifty grand. Right. Easy. And like, you're racing for purse. You don't tear stuff up. How many races? Race? Eighty. Like we have it's a big difference. Yeah, yeah. We have the models broke. That's, I mean, yeah. but you wouldn't be able to do that if the dirt model was the same as asphalt in the regard to having to rent the car. Yeah. No, no because way. the cars are expensive too. So yeah. that's also well, an age old. Too. I mean, that's like the thing, the dirt cars. I mean, you can't build a dirt, a brand new dirt late model for like, do it right. 130,000, I'd say. Okay, that's a, uh, if you built a late mile stock race ready and had someone build it, like the one that we're building down there is not going to cost that, obviously, because mm-hmm. we're doing all the work. But say you go to, I don't know, RNS or Force Reynolds and you ask for a brand new race car with the motor, everything in it, already built, rolling out of the shop, ready to go to the racetrack, you're going to spend between 100 and 130, yeah. too. So, but that's the age old. I guess fable is everyone thinks dirt racing is so much cheaper. Well, it might be cheaper, yeah. but I would argue that it's cheaper because the owners 
are invested yeah. in the cars and their team, and they're yeah. going out trying to find someone that's capable of winning money. Well, I think that's just the thing. It's not cheaper to buy the cars. The, the cars really aren't any cheaper. The purses are more. Mm -hmm. So we can go say, like when you know GR and I put this deal together, we put a set schedule. We committed to the outlaw tour because we <laughs> see the purses and the payout and said, all right, we probably need to go find this much sponsorship. We're going to try. You know, if we could get this much sponsorship, X amount, it would be nice. Because I'm not expecting to go win 25 races this year. Like, on rookie a year, it just ain't going to happen. You know what I mean? Racing against the best guys every night. Right. I'd never raced a late model. There's going to be a huge learning curve. So next year, when we get better and we start moving into the next, say, tax bracket of winnings, then we don't need as much sponsorship because you're taking in more money. I mean, like, you can't tell me that, like, Jonathan Davenport's car, Ricky Thornton's car, them guys are bringing in – the car's bringing like a million and a half, like at least, you know, it's crazy. So would you say that, so they, they also have sponsors. Yeah. So, 100%. but let's take the sponsors out of the equation. Do you, would you say that if Davenport were to run his car, would it break even without sponsor money? I think there's a few that would probably. Yeah. That's not, not, completely unheard of in yeah, asphalt. Yeah. Like, there's not even a chance in hell that would ever, ever a happen. You would because those are the elite guys. You know what I mean? If you're going to, you could budget it right where I say you could probably break even, you know, car wise, right. you know, like, you know, spending wise for sure. I just think that's insane. Yeah. Like, the fact that that's, that you're able to do that. But also, I don't know what the answer is because I guess really the only answer is okay, well, we need our races to pay more. Mm -hmm. But in order for our races to pay more, there has to be more value. Somebody's got to pay for it. Somebody has yeah. to. And then, you know, like Larson was saying, well, that's national TV audience. It's on the national TV, I guess, um, radar every week, the, all three top series of NASCAR. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if World of Outlaws is uh, behind a pay window on, uh, what, Dirt Vision? Mm -hmm. And then Lucas Oil is on Flow. Oh, yeah. So... I really wonder what the viewership is for those because they're still paying world. I mean, world of outlaws pays more than a truck race. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what a truck race pays, but I imagine so. I mean, there's a pays, lot. I, I guarantee you that most of the, the main shows, I don't know about like the midweek stuff. Our min, I think the minimum a race can pay is 10,000 for 30 lap race. That's the minimum. Like for, if we go to a track, that's way out there and, you know, middle of, I'll just say, North Dakota or something. Yeah. Small bull ring and, you know, the minimum to win is 10000 Like, that's the least they can pay. I, we won't go to, a, like, a race that, that pays less, I don't think, unless it's, like, a prelim night or something, you know? How many, uh, so when y'all travel to a race, how many races do you run that week? It all depends. You know, there's some weekends we <laughs> only run two or three races in a weekend, but um, there's one week out Midwest where we'll probably run, like, you know, well, almost 10 races in the, in the matter of just one trip out, you know, to the Midwest. You can go out in Illinois and Indiana and race every night. You know, I mean, there's places to race. Do it. It, it's crazy. Um, you know, we're kind of chasing the, the points deals and, um, you know, the rookie of the year money. There's a lot of, of good contenders for that this year. But just like we were talking last night, I mean, the asphalt stuff, you know, what does like the Car Stewart Championship pay? I don't even know. Zero doll hairs. Nothing. There is not a. There is the. In 2023, there was no points fund for the car store. Nothing. Nothing. Wow. I just want to say this: <laughs> 16 weeks of car store racing makes me want to vomit, and this dude's running 10 races in a trip. <laughs> it's because your heart's not in it, baby. I mean, yeah. shit. Yeah. You know what, though? Your heart's not in you it, baby. You asked me why the fan viewership is more, or like why the attendance is more in dirt than yeah. asphalt. You think about it. And the one thing that I hate about asphalt racing, I can't stand it. I hate getting there at 7 in the morning. I hate qualifying at, at <laughs> noon. I hate that we qualify at noon, and then we go back to the trailer and sit on our ass for Ugh. four hours, and then race at 8 p.m., and it's like, why are we here all damn day? Yep. I can get... I can get to the racetrack at 4 o'clock. No matter what asphalt series or track you go to, it's the You're same. there all day. Yeah, all what right. fan wants to sit out in 90-degree heat in the grandstands for 12 hours? Not me. <laughs> or crew member, exactly. <laughs> yeah, or crew member, thank you. Yeah. You don't you don't want to do it. I mean, I got like 
But in reality, a fan's not going to go out there and sit and watch practice. I mean, and some of them do. Some of them do, though. Yeah, but those are the I mean, diehards. Die but. but exactly, though. So basically, you're there for five hours, however long, and you, you only see one race. You know, the fan, the asphalt fan can basically only just show up for the big race. You yeah. get to the, put world finals in perspective at Charlotte. Hot laps don't roll out till six o'clock in the afternoon, five thirty-six. There's sprint cars, big blocks, and late models in one night, and all three features are done by 11 o'clock. That's practice, qualifying, heat races, B mains, dashes, and features. And they're all done by 11 o'clock. I do think the way uh, dirt racing is consumed is different from asphalt racing from a, a fan standpoint in the fact that um, it's two different styles. So... A dirt fan may not necessarily enjoy asphalt racing because the races are too long. Mm -hmm. And an asphalt r fan may not necessarily enjoy dirt racing all that much. While it's action-packed, mm -hmm. I could go take a shit and miss the feature event, <laughs> you know? like. <laughs> Yeah. So it's yeah. done, it's over and done with in six minutes. So yeah. like, I think that the consumption of the style of racing is definitely different genre to genre, but I agree. I mean, na asphalt racing could be condensed. Oh. 1,000% and yes. should be. Like, should we shouldn't be. be. Well, I mean, no Tri County is pretty better. condensed. Yeah, it's better. We don't, we don't just. They don't start, I mean, you know. We don't, don't drag our ass. You don't show up at 9 in the morning to, to pick out your tires and sit around and practice at 2.30. Yeah. I mean, you can show up there at one one thirty. But that's yeah. just a weekly show. I mean, we're talking an about. argument to it, but you can't tell me that if you told a race fan he could go watch an asphalt race and show up at four o'clock watch practice qualifying heat races we don't do heat races practice qualifying maybe a dash for the top 10 cars or something and then the feature in five hours and he's gonna say no i'd rather go watch practice at 9 a.m and then watch qualifying at 2 p.m and then go back to my car and sleep for four <laughs> hours and maybe you know get there two hours before the feature you know you can't tell me that a fan wouldn't like to just sit down and watch it all like I remember going to Hickory back in the day, and and it was it seemed like they used to run it off quicker back in the day. I mean they would have driver interactions. I remember going to Hickory. I don't remember the driver, the yellow twenty nine car back in the day. Andy Loden. Yeah. Yep. And uh, he came and threw me a frisbee, and then like they had just done you know qualifying. They lined the cars up for the race right after. You came in drivers. I still you know got the frisbee to this day, signed by him. Yeah. You know and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I remember that, and it just seems like as nowadays you just don't get the same thing. I don't know what it is. Well, I haven't been to a weekly show at Hickory in ten years either, but I I don't know. That's just how I feel about it. Is it could be a lot quicker, and I think that would help the fan attendance. Well, a lot of the weekly shows, I will say that a lot of the weekly tracks, they'll qualify at five thirty. 5 five thirty, and a lot of fans do come in watch qualifying immediately after qualifying is a fan fest and then the racing starts that's good yeah. so that aspect yes but the we're still at hickory at freaking eight in the morning nine in the morning yeah. until you, yeah. 11 so 30 12 at night tire barn opens at 10 we have to get there to pick our tires yeah because if, if you not, don't do morning practice you're not your car is not on the racetrack until two o'clock yeah why is there morning practice because it's a money racket. Well, money see, racket. See, back in the day, like when you're talking about when loading and them were running, they had practice on Friday. Yeah. And then Saturday, you showed up at 12 o'clock, 12.30, whatever. Gates open at 1, yeah. Yeah, and then you just have your normal rounds of practice, I qualifying like, race. I like that. Now, they combine it all into one day. I don't know. Why do they do that? Do you really need more so practice? Y'all get so much practice already. What do you need more <laughs> practice for? Listen, you're you preaching to the laps. <laughs> you're preaching to the choir, brother. I agree. Two I laps. mean, in the car store, we are two day shows everywhere. Mm -hmm. We have three. We have one hour and two thirty minute sessions on Friday, and then two thirty, sometimes two forty five minute sessions on Saturday, mm -hmm. and that's our schedule. We do not need that Friday. No. No chance in hell. Really, give us like, one 30- or 45-minute practice on Saturday and be done with it. And I know Dirt even says, well, that's still way too much. Well, I agree that we practice too much, but I think you could probably attest that on the asphalt side, practice is definitely different yeah, from – because the car means so much, mm -hmm. and also you don't have to worry about the track rubbering in or slicking up or – you know, track condition doesn't change necessarily on the asphalt side other than it does rubber up. But yeah, weather, yeah. Weather can, you know, obviously, like, 
when the track's colder, you have more grip in the asphalt. Right. But, yeah. It's, it's you, minimal compared to the difference I, in dirt. Everybody always says, well, like, you know, just like your argument there. And I do 100% get that, that you got to dial them in a lot more than you do a dirt car because um, you can't make up for it. But I will say, when they exit or they ex practice and all this junk out during COVID, I thought it made the cup races and the truck races better. Like, I thought it made it more competitive because, like, all the time in the asphalt stuff, you you show up with this wacky stuff to try to find a half second because you can. You got two hours of practice. To get it back, yeah. Well, maybe the, the exit practice, everybody would show up with some more normal stuff, and you know what I mean? Then Which they're chasing it for. They have at the truck and Xfinity level. I mean, they get, like, mm-hmm. one 15-minute practice, go straight to qualifying. I like it. I think it's cool. Why, why we do what we do at the – I don't know. I mean, yeah. honestly, what I just said makes me – want to vomit about our car store <laughs> yeah. schedule because See? it costs us so much more you kill me about not having the heart but i'm not that wrong and I yeah also, you just don't want to go race you just you that's not true <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about just it, sheer heart here seth uh, it just goes i mean it, it's two days of that's all day, day two days yeah i like and driving a race home, car but i don't want to you get home saturday practicing. night at, you know middle of the freaking night and then sunday you're killed you can't do mm-hmm. nothing because you're so damn tired yeah so you've been slaving for two days. So back to my original conversation before this gets way too long. Um, I have a theory. I don't think that dirt drivers see themselves as stars. Like all of them were saying, oh, you can't compare this to that. Bullshit. I compare you guys to the upper echelon of asphalt because you guys are superstars in your in your genre. But also, you're doing it for a living. There's very few people. I don't think dirt people realize how very few people on asphalt are doing it and making a living doing it without spending an atrocious amount of money. Yeah. I don't think they realize that. I don't think you can make a living on the asphalt stuff the way it is. It's hard. You have to find someone that's willing to pay for you to be there or a team that's willing to... I've always wondered, like, how the asphalt modified guys do it, right? Because they, they only race 15 races a year. Hey, the braces pay twelve thousand to win or whatever it is, but I mean, obviously, I don't know what their driver like the the good guys' driver percentage is. But I, I had an opportunity to go full time asphalt modified race instead of dirt, and you know, it's probably a good opportunity to maybe go to the next level of asphalt racing. But I said no because I need money to live. <laughs> like I don't know how they do it. You know, they have to have other jobs, and you know, just like you're doing. I mean, if it wasn't for the social media and the podcast stuff, like you just said it, that's how you make your money and it's badass, you know, but like, I don't see, like if you were dirt racing, doing the same thing, like you're obviously a talented driver. If you could do the same, you know, finishes and just like you won 30 grand, I don't know how much of that you got, but. Uh, Zero doll hairs. Yeah. See, that's, <laughs> that's crazy to me. I mean, that's a good paying purse. And on dirt, the driver would obviously get a, a solid cut of that. I don't know where that got lost. And, you know, when I won Watkins Glen, I think I got 1500 bucks. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, for winning Watkins Glen, you, everybody's like, oh, man, that's probably the biggest paying race you ever won. I'm like, no. Probably the, probably probably the smallest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, yeah. I think that the problem is the only way to make money in asphalt racing is to be the person renting the car. Mm-hmm. I could make great money renting late mile stock cars right now. But you want to race. But I don't want to do that because guess what? That shit ain't fun. (laughs) I mean, it is. Okay, I take that back. It would be fun to, if if you're competitive, but you're not always going to be competitive when you do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to race. I raced more this past year than I ever have. How much money did I make racing? Zero. But I made my money. I used my racing as a vessel to make money Mm -hmm. through YouTube and all the other ass all the other um ass i said ass ass all the other assets that i have from a social standpoint <laughs> yes but um i don't know i don't know what the answer is we're not going to solve it on this podcast i do have one intellectual question because i don't really know shit about dirt racing mm-hmm. so you said a, a brand new dirt weight model 130 grand right i'd have to say probably how often do dirt guys build new cars is it like asphalt racing Bobby where you're Pierce, gonna build one like the start can. of the year and sell it at the end and build another one or i won volusia twice with the same car a year apart so i don't know do I the mean, cars wear out often they do yeah, that's that's kind of you know i th- the big blocks do more than the late models i think so like 
you know, GR said that Davenport had, when he was racing with the 22 car, he had one car they really liked, and they kept, you know, swapping other cars and kept that one car. Like, I know Bobby Pierce had a car that he's been winning with for, like, six years. Once you get a good car, it's a good car. But, like, the big block stuff, we don't have a four-link rear suspension, so our rear end doesn't really move like that. We have to kind of, like, I just think that the late models have a lot more, like, mechanical grip to where the chassis doesn't need to flex as much. They can build them a lot more rigid. They have independent front suspension where a big block has a solid front axle. Mm -hmm. So I think you can get away with a lot more because you, the chassis aren't flexing as much. So just like the asphalt stuff, I mean, your center section, the car you won with was from how old? 1990. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, yeah, but that it is was a, a... It was a chore to be competitive yeah. with that thing. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, that is a rare occasion. But yeah. I also, I mean, we did that because that was the only option I had to start mm -hmm. the year. You know, that was the only car, the only chassis we had. And also, I mean, don't get me wrong. I feel like maybe ego is not the word, but like the drive to prove that you can do it with that still oh, was, was definitely a motivating factor. But also a motivating factor was I didn't have, I was broke as shit, you know, <laughs> basically. So it was pretty much, it is what it is. Yeah. Like I can't complain because that's what we have. Know. But I also have my dad you know, working yeah. on it. So it's not like, at least at the short track level, you can offset. There's no way in hell you could take a car with a center section built in 1990 and run in no. Arca or trucks yeah. or anything like that. But at a late mile stock level, at least there's still some small hope for a grassroots guy. Mm -hmm. If you have someone working on your shit that is smart mm -hmm. and that can get the most out of it and make the most out of what you have, that, I guess sort of blue collar dream is still there a little bit, yeah. but it's, it's still, we're slowly inching away from that. Um, it's getting worse and worse. That is for sure. Um, yeah, the asphalt stuff, it's crazy to me and it's only going to keep going up. I mean, stuff's only getting more expensive. These car owners are getting outrageous money to, to rent a car. And I see it even in the dirt, like at Millbridge, there's a lot of rental cars and, I asked last night, just curious. I'm like, man, you know, it'd probably be fun to go run a micro every once in a while. I'm like, <laughs> I asked, I'm not naming names. But I asked yeah. somebody what it would cost. They told me, I'm like, how much? Twenty five hundred dollars to run a micro on a Wednesday night. See, now I think that's cheap. Yeah, <laughs> you I can't mean, rent shit on asphalt for twenty five hundred bucks. Yeah, I, I get it, but still, it's starting. It's starting in the dirt, which I don't like to see. You know, that's twenty five hundred dollars seems crazy to me. P like plus a crash fee. So say you went out and won, that's twenty five hundred bucks. The race pays like five hundred to win at Millbridge, I think. Yeah. I don't know. It might pay more now. But Shit, I, I don't know. you mean I can get five hundred of my dollars back? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Shit. I don't know. I you don't know what it pays to win a twin at Hickory Motor Speedway? One a late model stock twin. So a forty lap late model stock race. How much do you think? I don't Guess. Know. Just one of them. Well, Just you're, one. Making, you're making me want to shoot low. Oh, you, I want to know what your I low bet is. You can't go low enough. <laughs> <laughs> no. Six hundred and twenty-five dollars. Guess how much a set of tires is. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, eight hundred and sixty dollars. Was it? Was it last year? The year before? You won both twin races and made what twenty bucks that day? Uh this Wait, last year I won both twin races, and no. I lost twenty five dollars. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then and then this year I won the late model race and the limited race, or I finished second limited, won late model, and I lost like three hundred dollars for winning both both races. Mm. Incredible. Um, but that is Hickory is not the only place that has low purse. It, mm -hmm. There's a there is a number of places now. There are some tracks better that are better. You know what I mean? I know it that sucks. going in. That's ridiculous. Yeah, Absolutely that's how stupid ridiculous. it is. Like, I would but. love to pay myself a percentage of purse when I race my own cars because I'm breaking my, you know, back trying to find sponsors, mm -hmm. and I would love to pay my guys that go to the track because they're breaking their back for me for nothing. But we're in a losing business here, so... <laughs> I mean, literally, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to yeah. split negative twenty five dollars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my my pay to them is let's go to Pockets of Brews and buy your own beer. Buy your own beer. <laughs> you can enjoy just, my just, time. Just my yeah, just the invite to Pockets is your payment. I was about to say, you know, I can at least buy my beer, but I don't even know if I bought y'all beer there. That's terrible. That's terrible. There was a lot in that. Um, thank you to Max for carrying that segment. Because 
you know, I don't really know a whole lot about it. So that was why we brought Max on here to talk about it. And he did a phenomenal job. Um, so this is getting down to the end of this episode. I still have a lot of questions. I mean, I wish there was a way that asphalt racing could mirror the path that dirt racing's on. And I'm sure that there's some aspects of asphalt racing, like the social media following and things of that nature, that probably could add more money to the dirt world if those things were to be elevated. But <clears throat> for the time being, I think that there's a lot of things asphalt needs to uh, evaluate the asphalt side of things and then also look at dirt and, and say what are the tracks, the promoters, the owners, and the series doing right on the dirt side that we're not, and how can we at least somewhat try to mimic that to get some of that aura? Because the Gateway Dirt Nationals was badass. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. It made me want to go do it. That's sick. But I'm a racer, and watching that, you're like, that's well, how fucking awesome is that? value. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just one thing that the dirt does well. Yeah, it does. I agree. Yeah. Um, so we'll see what happens. I sure hope to God that we get some more purse on the asphalt side because... I hope you do too. Yeah. You might be seeing me and Seth and RJ going dirt go-kart racing <laughs> because that's about the equivalent to the hey, money that we spend right now. You would cry if you saw some of them go-kart purses. <laughs> yeah, probably so. I uh, I don't remember the dude's name, but did you see that interview the other day where he like flipped his car and they went and asked him about it and he's like, oh, well, we flipped it over. Car's all right. It's we're just going to send it. We're going to send that bitch. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah, I do have a question, Max. I love that yeah. shit. Yeah. At the Okay, this might just be the, the dome, but at the Gateway Dirt Nationals, is it freaking mandatory that you have to cuss in your interview? I don't know. I think they, I think do, they told him in the driver meeting, like, hey, man. I think they do, and they tell you to, like, you know, do some stupid shit for sure. Yeah, because every single interview, there was a cuss word. That yeah, guy did. He said, like it. No, that, well, I it was entertaining. But, the guy that runs it tells you, like, all right do something make it interesting it's a show you know the i asked my car and i'm like can we go next year he's like if you have a car that we kill and you get a sponsor to go to that race then we'll go <laughs> but we ain't taking like our cars are beautiful i mean my gr likes his stuff like pristine immaculate. yeah he will never go there unless we had a car in the back that's you could eat on it sleep kind of like us yeah. in the yeah. stadium you could eat on it sleep on it on yeah. it yeah <laughs> You, you know, it all. everything. <laughs> the the yeah. trio. Yeah. 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 I think that's where asphalt's. I don't know if I'd eat off of our cars. I'd probably do Hell the other. No, you don't clean them things. <laughs> that is not true. I clean them. Y'all wouldn't know you that don't come to the shop. Probably eat off of yeah. For now. I would do the back the back twos. I'd sleep on it and I'd probably on it, but I don't know if I'd eat on, eat off of it. I don't know. I feel like I've probably ate a sandwich off the dick lid before. The modified you probably could eat. You've off definitely of. ate worse in your time, Seth. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> probably <laughs> cut <laughs> <laughs> oh shit all right well God. thank you guys uh so much for listening to this it didn't get as off the rails as some of my podcasts have and there was probably some knowledgeable information in there uh from max anyways so uh, i appreciate each and every one of you guys listening i'm not going to review a review this week i don't even know if we have any new ones and rj's not here to uh uh blurt out five stars uh well he's just sitting over there but he's here and he here. we have the extra mic that could probably capture it probably but i just don't feel like looking up any reviews uh, so i don't think we have any <laughs> probably we didn't even not. know what national day it was today yeah we didn't even do that hey max what's that? the best liquor drink uh to drink on a cruise by the way dude painkiller i don't even know what's in it but i had a few of them painkiller what yeah. is that like I uh Oh man, I guess. Are we talking about like prescription medication no, here? No, that's a oh. drink. It's it's like <laughs> I don't know what's in it. Some pineapple stuff. There's a dude named Floater Mark that I met on the the cruise. He earned the nickname well. <laughs> <laughs> he told me to get a painkiller when I got back on the boat, and I did. And we all had them all week, and they were delicious. Nice. I had to did you do the drink package, or did, were I you did, paying yeah. for them separate? Oh yeah, yeah. You, you got to do the drink package. I've never been on a cruise. So. Oh dude, it's awesome. That was my second one. It's it's fun. Maybe we'll all have to... Uh, we should go next year. Maybe we'll all have to do that. That would be a fun trip. Yeah. You know, if if Max races 80 play. weekends and can still find time to go on a cruise, maybe we can <laughs> as well. Yeah, that's just the late model, too. Yeah. I was going to run with the Modify. And yeah. Uh, clearly, it can't be 80 weekends. Well, it's 80 races. 80 Sorry. Races, it's not yeah. 80 weekends. I feel like... <laughs> see, he gets to race during the week, and oh, we wow. have to... We're limited yeah. to Saturday. That's, see, that's, that's where it... Yeah. Also... Uh, for those of you that are interested in RJ's smoke break, it will be returning to the podcast. However, RJ is branching out on his own. He has a YouTube channel. RJ, what is your YouTube channel? RJ Williams? 
at RJ underscore W21. So make sure you guys go subscribe to that. He's going to have some standalone smoke breaks. God knows what he's going to talk about. I have no idea. I'm not here to filter them and edit them. So I started to say, it could no be affiliation with Huffman Racing whatsoever. <laughs> it could be shut down real quick. <laughs> so make sure you get over We there. are all going to be Watch canceled from one can. smoke break. Yeah. Watch it while you can. yeah. So get over there and support RJ. Uh, we are going to bring it back here on the, on the show, obviously, but we're just not going to do it every week. Uh, but thank you guys so much for listening. If you haven't dropped us a review yet, you can do that on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or whichever platform you are listening on. Uh, if you're on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button, like the video. helps us get out to a new audience. Uh, but you can leave a uh, text review on Apple Podcasts and then just a, a five-star rating on Spotify. But thank you guys so much. Max, thank you for coming on, man. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. I'll yeah. do it again sometime. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Maybe go win a bunch of races and make a lot of money, and then you can pay me to come on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go, go win a lot of money and come back pointing Landon's face and laugh. Thank you, Seth. <laughs> 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 all right ladies and gentlemen that's going to do it for another episode of and racing radio we really appreciate it we will uh maybe talk to you guys next week i don't know uh in the meantime thanks for listening we'll talk to you soon